Okay. Should we turn to Exodus chapter 34 together? It's the second book of the Bible. You don't need to uh, look very far to find it. And I'm going to read from verses 4 to 16. But before I do that, I'm just going to pray. So why don't we pray together? Father God, we pray that you would lovingly challenge us this evening. Just as Tom shared earlier, that you're a God who loves us so much that you challenge us. You turn tables over in our lives. And you clear out things in our lives that are not of you. And we do pray tonight that you would do that. That we would know your loving challenge, Heavenly Father. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you so much. He's good, isn't he? He's good. Let's read chapter 34, verses 4 to 16. So Moses is back up the uh, mountain with God. Um, A few chapters before this, Moses had uh, been given the Ten Commandments by God, and then he had seen that down at the bottom of the mountain, uh, the Israelites were worshipping a golden calf that they had made. So he's gone back up the mountain because he'd smashed the tablets, and God's made, made some new tablets, and this is what we read in verses 4 onwards. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found favour in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. And he said, Behold, I am making a covenant. Before all your people I will do marvels such as have not been seen in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Take care, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their Asherim, for you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Tonight I'm going to talk about the jealous God. Now those verses that we've read out together just now are often quoted. Certainly the earlier verses in that passage are often quoted. You might hear come, someone come up the front on a Sunday and share those verses that God is, a, God is slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Very rarely will someone read through to the end of that section where God declares himself to be a jealous God where he reveals himself to be a God who is jealous. Jealousy and God don't seem to go together. It doesn't seem right that he should declare himself as jealous. When we think of jealousy, we think of the most soul-destroying vice that we can know, one that really crushes us and makes us feel worthless, makes us wish we were someone else. Oprah Winfrey, who many of you will know, um, he, uh, she, I just, I just got thrown by the fact someone's written, I love TS forever on my, sh- my sheet of paper. <laughs> it's, not, it's not my wife's handwriting either, so I don't know what's going on there. So Oprah Winfrey is definitely not a he. Oprah Winfrey, she was interviewed. <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> Oprah Winfrey was, ri- uh, was, oh man. It was you, James. Thanks so much. Thanks a bunch. Um, Oprah Winfrey was interviewed a number of years ago about her religious beliefs. And in the interview, she said that she left the Baptist church in which she grew up the night she heard a preacher declare that God is a jealous God. And uh, she has obviously gone on to be a very successful woman and one of the richest women uh, in the world, I think. And uh, she left the Baptist church because she heard the preacher say, God is a jealous God. And she said, how can God be jealous of me? 
If God's jealous of me, I don't want to know him. And she's got a very strange spirituality now. It's kind of a mixture of Christianity and anything else that she fancies. And uh, she was really struggling with this concept of God being a jealous God. Is God jealous of us? Is he jealous of us? I don't think so. So what does it mean that he's a jealous God? Jealousy to us implies resentment or hostility towards someone because we want what they've got. We hate someone or we resent someone because we want what they've got. It causes us to get ill. It can become overbearing and it can be all demanding on us. It can kill joy in our lives. Most of us have been there at some point when we've really envied someone for something they have or something they do or maybe the clothes they wear or, the, or whatever it might be. And so because we've experienced jealousy in human terms, it doesn't quite fit with us that God could be a jealous God. It irks us when we hear that he is jealous. And yet he's gone on record about this. It's on his CV. He's happily, happy to declare again and again that he's a jealous God. It's not just in this passage that we read it that he's a jealous God. God is not jealous of you. There's nothing in us that he envies or wants. He's not jealous of your iPhone. He doesn't need time hop to remind him what was going on five years ago. He doesn't need the weather app to see what's going on with the weather. He's making the weather. He's not jealous of your clothes. He's not wishing he had that super dry gilet that you have. I'm preaching to the Canterbury crowd here. <laughs> he is not jealous of us. There's nothing in us that we have or that we do that he envies. So we need to understand a couple of things if we're to get our heads around the fact that he's a jealous God. Firstly, we've got to understand that biblical statements about God are anthropomorphisms. That's the only big word I'm going to use tonight, okay? Biblical statements about God are anthropomorphisms. This is the, this is the, the case that, that the Bible uses human language and human examples to try and convey something about what God is like. Because we're more like God than any other creatures or created things are like God. It's, um, it's more illuminating and less misleading for God to describe himself in ways that we as humans can understand. If he described himself in ways that are concerning other created things, it would be really misleading. And so he describes himself in ways that we as humans can understand, but we've got to understand that it's an incomplete picture. We as humans are sinful, we're corrupted by sin. And so we don't get the full picture. It's like with God's wrath. We as human beings, we can experience uh, an anger sometimes, but it's corrupted by sin. God's wrath is not corrupted by sin or insecurity. It's pure. Ours is often corrupted by pride and weakness. So we can understand God in some ways when he says that he's a jealous God, but we don't understand it fully because we only have our own framework to kind of understand what jealousy is all about. There's actually a jealousy that is completely holy and righteous. There's two kinds of jealousy. There's a vicious jealousy and there's a righteous jealousy. Vicious, vicious jealousy is an expression of that attitude, I want what you've got, and I resent you, and I hate you because I haven't got it. It's fed by pride that says, I deserve that. I deserve better than what I've got. I deserve what you've got. That's vicious jealousy. It can cause someone who's otherwise stable to be torn to shreds. But there's a righteous jealousy as well. This is more to do with zeal. Zeal to protect a love relationship or to avenge when unfaithfulness has occurred. The demand of the covenant that we read from Exodus 34 earlier is don't be a whore. Don't be a harlot. Don't commit adultery against me. Don't let your heart turn from me and go to other things. Don't compromise with those who have idols. And God uses the illustration of marriage. It's like his people are married to him through that covenant. So he uses an illustration of marriage. I'm going to use one too. I'm married to Sarah. And like most Christian men, I'm punching above my weight. <laughs> I meet so many Christian guys and think, how on earth? <laughs> and it's the, case, it's the case for me as well. It's the case for me. 
I'm punching well above my weight. So if Sarah is speaking to another guy, and I'm just like, she shouldn't be speaking to him, then that's possessive and insecure of me, and potentially quite a dangerous attitude to have if I like stop her from speaking to other men. <laughs> However, if I see another man trying to allure her away from me and to seduce her, to take her for his own wife, then what would rise up within me is a righteous jealousy. It's a zeal to protect a covenant that has been made because she's mine and I'm hers. So that is a righteous jealousy. And that is what we're talking about when it comes to God. It's a positive virtue. It shows that if, if I was to have that righteous jealousy, it shows that I grasp that it's a serious deal that we've made a covenant. In fact, if I didn't have that righteous jealousy bubbling up within me, then I wouldn't be very loving towards my wife. If I was like, oh, it's fine. Yeah, she can have another husband. That's absolutely no problem. That wouldn't show me to be a very loving husband at all. Scripture views God's jealousy as this latter kind. His jealousy is a righteous jealousy. He's jealous that what is rightfully his remains his. What is rightfully his remains his, and it's not given to someone else. The Old Testament regards God's covenant as like a marriage with Israel. It carries a demand for Israel to be unqualified, faithful, loving, loyal. So the worship of idols and all of the compromising with those who do worship idols, that's a big deal for God. And yet, what we read in the pages of the Old Testament is that again and again, Israel turns its back on God and goes after other things and compromises with those in other nations who worship other gods and idols. God's second commandment was, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. And yet, he's giving that command to Moses, and at that very same time, the Israelite people are melting down their jewelry and making a baby calf, which is a ridiculous image. You think you might make a lion or something kind of majestic, they make a baby cow. And God sees what's going on, and he's like, I'm going to just have to wipe them all out, Moses. I'm going to have to kill them all. And Moses says, no, no. If you do that, then the, the people of the other nations will look on and say, God's just dragged these people out into Egypt, and he's killed them all. Your name will be dishonored. Your name will be dragged into disrepute. And so God relents, and he shows mercy, and the covenant gets renewed. He's a merciful God. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? Because we... We are so like Israel. We can look at the Old Testament and maybe you're doing a reading plan and, and, and reading about the history of the people of God and you just see them again and again turning their backs on him. We can think, how stupid are they? They saw all these amazing miracles. They saw God take them out of slavery and provide for their every need. He brought down food from heaven for them. He did so many amazing things and yet they turn their back on him again. We are exactly the same. We are exactly the same. We've seen God do amazing things in our lives. We've seen him provide for us in miraculous ways. He's saved us. He's brought us out of slavery. He's killed off our enemy. And yet we turn away from him and turn to other things so, so often. So I'm going to look tonight just about how we have idols in our lives that we need to uproot and replace. I want to talk about four ways in which we discern these idols in our lives. And I've borrowed these from a book called Counterfeit Gods, which is by Timothy Keller. I'd really like you to just, I'd like to encourage you to get hold of this book. It's excellent. Four ways in which we discern idols in our lives. The first thing is this. Consider what, what do we do with our imagination? What do we do in our solitude? Last thing at night as you're trying to get off to sleep, what is it that your mind goes to? When you're on your own in the daytime, maybe just catching uh, 10 minutes peace, what is it that your mind starts wandering about? What do you daydream about? Is it 
a house, a great house, full of great things? Is it a new job that will be free of stress but will earn you £100,000 a year? Is it a holiday in the Maldives with the perfectly clear water and drinking from a coconut? What is it that your mind wanders to? Is it that perfect spouse who will be amazingly hot and will never ever demand anything from you? What is it that your mind wanders to? It could be that if you frequently think about the same thing, it could be that that is an idol in your life. One or two daydreams here and there doesn't make an idol. But if you're constantly, frequently thinking about something, it may well be that that is an idol in your life. Secondly, where do we spend our money? Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart is. Where does the majority of your money go? Is there something that you're spending so, so much money on that you have to constantly check yourself? Am I, am I spending a bit too much there? Do I need to exercise a bit of self-control there? Is it that you spend hundreds of pounds a month on clothing in order to always look the part? Is it you're spending hundreds of pounds a month on your car so that you can really show everyone that you've got a great car? What is it that you're spending your money on? Where's it going? If you are adamant that your life is all about the kingdom of God, bringing in the kingdom, then your money should, the first fruits of your money should be going to God. If it's going first and foremost to many, many other things, then we haven't got our priorities in the right place. Where is your money going? Is there something that you're spending so much money on? It might be that that is an idol in your life. Thirdly, what is your functional saviour? We'll all say that Jesus is our saviour, right? I'm sure that you probably wouldn't be here unless you, you said that. Of course he's our saviour. But what is our functional saviour? What do we look to when times are really tough? What do we turn to? Is it that we turn to food? Or we turn to pornography, fantasy? Do we turn to a particular friend that we just know they'll always listen to us they'll always have time for us or do we run to God when times are hard first and foremost what do we turn to who's our fun what's our functional savior think of it like this maybe you're praying for x and if you had x you'd be really happy if only you had x then you would be satisfied in life what is it that you're praying for what is it that you're hoping for that if you only had it then everything would be well in the world that might well be an idol in your life it might well be. Fourthly, what are your uncontrollable emotions? What emotions never seem to lift? Is it fear? Is it fear that you're just fearful all of the time? Is it something that you're fearing that you perceive as being threatened? You perceive that a necessity is being threatened when it's not really a necessity at all? Is there something that you're angry about all of the time? That you're bitter about? What is it? What's underneath that? You've got to pull those emotions up by the roots and you'll see that there's all sorts of idols clinging on. When you pull those emotions up, you'll see what is underneath them. If someone or something has taken the place of Christ in our love, in our loyalty, in our service and in our delight, then that is an idol and we need to deal with it. I feel that tonight we're going to deal with it. Tom uh, Shaw earlier on spoke about God bringing challenge to us. I do believe that this is something that is building on that. That God tonight wants to lay his loving and gracious fatherly hand on you and just say, tonight, there's something you've just got to deal with. This is idle. This is something that you're just placing before me. You've got to deal with it tonight. We can do business with him tonight. We've got time. We can do business with him. He's a jealous God. He won't share the throne of our hearts with anyone or anything else. We've got to realize that this will take a lifetime because we might deal with one idol, but you know, we'll set something else up as an idol in our hearts. Our hearts are idol factories, a famous theologian once said. Our hearts are idol factories. We're constantly being distracted by something. Something else comes along and we think, oh yeah, that is really going to satisfy me. That's really going to bring me the fulfillment that I crave and desire. 
and yet it comes to disappoint us again and again. You know, when it comes to worship, it's like a, our garden hose that is always on. We're always worshipping. And with a garden hose that is always on, you have to you direct it either at the grass, at the flowers, at the house, at the car, at your kids, whatever it might be. You direct it at something. We're always worshipping. We're made to worship and we're always worshipping. We've got to direct it at Jesus. And every time that we see ourselves directing at something that's not Jesus, we redirect it. That's what I believe God is calling us to do tonight. Idols can't just be removed. They must be replaced. They must be replaced. We need a daily living encounter with Jesus. That's the only way we replace idols, is a daily living encounter with Jesus. Colossians 3, verse 3 says this, If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So if you've been raised with Christ, who's been raised with Christ here? Most of you. Some people can't be bothered to lift up their hands. Fine, that's fine. You've still been raised with Christ. If you've been raised with Christ, set your mind on Christ. It's an intentional thing that we have to do. We set our minds on him, not on things of the earth. We, this is exactly what I'm talking about. With idols, we're just setting our minds on created things. We've got to set our minds on Jesus, the one who is seated at the right hand of God. It's an intentional thing. Sarah and I have got a small garden, and we've got three small children. And it's not a very um, good environment for growing anything. It's, in fact, it's, it's useless because our children just dig anything up that we plant. In fact, we've resolved not to plant anything for the next few years. We're just going to have mud in our garden. <laughs> and every summer, I, because we've got nothing planted there, every summer we just get a whole bunch of weeds pop up. And so I dig them out. Six weeks later, they're back. Six weeks, without a doubt, they'll be back and bigger than they were before because I haven't replaced those weeds with anything else. They just keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back. I need to plant something in its place. One day, we're going to have a garden that's like Jamie Oliver's garden. You know, on the, his show, and he just says, I'm just going to pop into my garden, get a few herbs, and he's just got this most amazing, that's what it's going to be one day. But right now, it's just mud. <laughs> we need to plant something in the place of those weeds. It's like that with idols. It's not the case that we just have to repent, and tonight, many of us will repent and just say, God, I've put something in your place I've understood, I've understood tonight that this is not what you want for me. You're a jealous God. You want my affection and attention wholly and completely. And we'll, ret- we'll turn from our sins, but we need to replace those things with Jesus and becoming obsessed with Jesus. He is so amazing. And we think we can just get so bored of him, right? We can think, I know all I, all I can about Jesus. I've got to the end of it all now. I think I just... You know, God has always been delighted with his son, Jesus, for eternity. He's found Jesus eternally interesting, eternally satisfying. He's delighted in him for for eternity. We cannot get bored of Jesus. We cannot get bored of him. He is amazing. I want to just recommend a couple of books to you that I'd love for you to get hold of. There's a, a whole wodge of these books at the bookstore, which will be open tomorrow. The Good God by Michael Reeves. This is a book that is all about the good God. And as you read it, your view of God and how, how beautiful he is will just cause you to worship. There's another book in the same series called Christ, Our Life, which I'm reading through at the moment, all about Jesus. It will help you to turn the hose of your worship onto Jesus rather than onto created things. If we turn our attention to Jesus, the heart relaxes its grip on other things that it thinks it needs. You know what? If we don't deal with this, we're going to live a life of misery and disappointment because we're going to think that those idols that we place our faith in are going to sort us out and be good for us when ultimately they just cause us to be crushed. John Piper says this, Whatever lures your affections away from God with deceptive attraction will come back to strip you bare and cut you in pieces. It is a horrifying thing to use your God-given life to commit adultery against the Almighty. It's a horrifying thing. 
whatever it is that lures your affections away from him, will return to strip you bare, leave you completely disappointed, dissatisfied. God is preoccupied with his own glory. He, is, he, he loves it that we glorify him. We were singing, glorify your name in all the earth. He loves it. He loves being glorified. He loves it when we come to see him as worthy of worship. He loves it when we come to see him as all satisfying. It's the most loving attribute of God that he wants worship. We think that might be self-centered of God. We think that might be a little bit egotistical. No, it's the most loving attribute of him that he wants us to worship him because it's the very, very best thing for us that we come to see him as all satisfying and not sex or uh, wealth or power and influence. He wants us to come to see that he alone satisfies, that he alone offers life in all its fullness. He wants us to see him as worthy. It's the most loving thing about him, that he wants his own glory. He wants to be worshipped in all the earth. It's like if you and I had the vaccine for the Zika virus that is um, ripping through parts of South America right now. We turned up in El Salvador and just said, hey guys, come to me because I've got exactly what you need. I've got the vaccine. It's going to sort you out. That would be the most loving thing that we could do to point people to ourselves. It's like that with God. He absolutely wants us to be obsessed with him, to find that he alone is worthy. He's saying, come to me, worship me. He's the best thing for us. So the right response, the right response to his jealousy for us is our zeal for him. His jealousy for us has caused him to send his son Jesus to come and rescue us from all of this idolatry. That's essentially what sin is. It's putting our faith in created things and in things which we think are going to satisfy God sent his son Jesus so that we could be rescued from that. He is so jealous for us, his people, that he wants us to be free from that. He wants us to be walking in freedom from idolatry. So in view of that mercy, in view of what he's done for us, our response is to offer our lives as living sacrifices. That's our spiritual act of worship, is to offer ourselves. Our devotion is to his person, his cause, and his honor. I love this quote from Bishop J.C. Ryle. It's from a few, few decades ago now. Listen to this. A zealous man is primarily a man of one thing. It's not enough to say that he's wholehearted or fervent in spirit. He only sees one thing. He cares only for one thing. He lives for one thing. He is swallowed up in one thing, and that one thing is to please God. Whether he lives or dies, whether he has health or sickness, whether rich or poor, whether he pleases man or causes offense, whether he is thought wise or foolish, or whether he gets blame or praise, whether he gets honor or shame, for all this, the zealous man cares nothing at all. He burns for one thing, and that one thing is to please God and advance God's glory. Isn't that amazing? That is what a zealous man is cares for nothing else at all other than for the glory of God. Do we want that for our lives? Do we want that for our lives? Reminds me of the Apostle Paul. We heard this read out earlier. And he said, I forget everything that's gone behind. I'm striving to take hold of that for which God has taken hold of me. I don't want to know anything else other than to give God glory. Reminds me of Jesus when he said, my food is to do the will of my Father. When he said, the zeal for the house of the Lord has consumed me, it's eaten me up, I'm ruined for anything else. This is the kind of zeal that God wants us to have for him. Have we let zeal for God consume us? We need to, the place we need to start, friends, is, is really humbly and just to say, God, help me to begin to begin. That's what George Whitfield prayed. Lord, help me to begin to begin. It's baby steps. It's saying, God, I want to just begin in this lifetime of going after you with everything I have, of seeking first your glory, 
before anything else in my life. It's baby steps. You know, I've got a little boy at the moment who's just turned one. He can take about five steps before he face plants on the floor. And we're, every time he's taken that, those five steps, we're going mental like he's just run a marathon. We're so pleased with him. What sort of father would I be if, if he took those five steps and face planted on the floor? I just thought, oh, you're, you're just pathetic. Given up on you. You can only do five steps. What are you like? When will you learn? No, God, it, God with us is patient. He is so patient with us. And he loves it that we begin to begin. He loves it that we begin with putting to death things in our lives that have become idols. He loves it when we begin that process of becoming obsessed with him, becoming zealous about him. He loves it when we begin to begin to see him as all worthy of everything that we have. We make baby steps. And I just feel that this weekend is going to be a a time that for many, we're going to make those baby steps. Saying, God, I want to, that thing in my life or those things in my life, they're going to go. I want to put you first. I want to be zealous for you. God is not a cruel father who's just waiting for us to slip up. He's not a cruel father who's just going to get frustrated with us and think, oh, why do I bother? Let's take steps in rooting out idols in our lives. Let's do it tonight. Let's do business with God. Could I just um, invite the guys in the band just to be ready to just come up and ready to play? Should we stand together and pray?